Well, I hope you will turn to your Bibles this morning, uh, and we're going to be looking in Matthew chapter 28. We'll be reading this particular part of the resurrection story and then making some comments concerning that. Matthew chapter 28, and uh, we'll be reading those first eight verses. If you'll stand, please, as we honor God's Word. It says, Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning, and his clothing as white as snow, and the guard shook for fear of him, and he became like, and they became like dead men. And the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who is crucified. He's not here, for he's risen, as he said. Come and see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and indeed he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples' word. Let's pray. Father, thank you for how our hearts have been blessed already in this wonderful time of worship today. Together here on Easter Sunday, our great Super Bowl of all days, to celebrate who the Lord Jesus Christ is. Triumphant over death, over the tomb, triumphant over sin as he died on the cross as a sin debt for us. Lord, thank you that we can have the victory because of him. Bless now your word in these moments we share. We'll give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. All of us watched in horror on uh, Monday as we began to see the clips coming in about Notre Dame uh, Cathedral in Paris beginning to burn. And as it was burning and just an inferno, of course, all the different newscasts were turned there. An 850-year-old cathedral that uh, just began to go up and fear that everything would be lost and that everything would be collapsing. Fortunately, because of some of the renovations that were taking place, some of the most important statues and art pieces and the supposed crown of thorns of Jesus and maybe a piece of the cross, uh, some things like that had already been moved out of the way and other things were moved quickly when the fire began to take place. However, a cathedral that took some 200 years from start to the foundation to the finishing, its completion, was, uh, was really destroyed on the inside, though the stone structure seems to be intact. Some estimates have up to $3 billion uh, to see this particular cathedral restored. As you see, saw people gathered on the outside. We saw many people who were brought to their knees, many who began to cry, many who just were weeping uh, down on their knees, and some were interviewed. And, and here's the word that I, I began to hear from that that really uh, just really touched me was this, that some said those who really were not even religious were crying who looked to this simply as a great architectural piece, a real symbol of what, uh, uh, what Paris stood for, and it just had always been there, and they felt like it was the heart of the city, and it was gone. Some who may have even been atheistic, some who were uh, really not moved by what the cathedral stood for, or even what was on the inside, were weeping because they had lost such an important piece of who they were. You know, as I thought about that, I thought about this. You know, as we look to this particular Sunday, to many people, dare I say, perhaps to most of the people of the world, this is a day in history, but it's really not a personal loss to them that maybe personally it doesn't make a connection and has never made a connection as far as the death, the burial, and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. It just has never made that impact personally. You see, this is not a generic death. This is not a generic resurrection. Uh, this is very personable and ap applicable to each of us in our life, and we have to look to it in that particular way. 
You see, the resurrection of Jesus becomes a personal experience when we repent of our sins, acknowledging that we're a sinner and that Christ took our place on that old rugged cross and he died for us. And the fact that death could not keep him, but he came back just like he said he was going to do. And we serve a living Savior today. Amen? We serve a living Savior today. And so happy of that particular fact. Well, those earlier followers of Jesus were devastated from the events of the arrest on that Thursday night, all the trials of early Friday morning during the night, and then as Friday proceeded and Jesus hung on the cross, the horrors of that, and the disciples were fled, or at least in the shadows somewhere and nowhere really to be found. All of these things were beginning to take place here. And now as Jesus died on the cross and was buried, their evening on Friday at sundown as Passover began and Saturday was just a a day of numbness. Many of you, many of us have been there in those days in the loss of a close family member when we feel that loss. It's just kind of a numbness. It's an emptiness. It's as if our heart has been ripped out. And, And so I think the disciples were feeling some of that at this particular time. Everything seemed to be lost. There's no reason for them to even think about facing another day because everything that they had lived for in the last three years now to seem, seem to be buried with Jesus. But the truth of the matter is that the atoning sacrifice of Jesus on the cross would have absolutely no value if Jesus were not raised from the dead. Why, you say? Because Jesus said, I will be raised from the dead. And he said, I'm going to come back in three days. He would have become a liar. The prophecies would have lied about his resurrection. The many times he foretold his resurrection and death would all have been in, in vain. You see, This Sunday, Resurrection Sunday is the cornerstone, the very foundation of our faith. This is what it's all about. This is why we're here every Sunday because of this particular Sunday. Now, this is Sunday, a Sunday, Easter Sunday is special because it is the day we recognize that it happened 2,000 years ago. But every Sunday we worship is in light of the fact that he was resurrected on that first day of the week. So we're here today is in that Super Bowl of Christians as we normally think about that. And we celebrate this truth on a regular occasion. So what was it? that we can think about that personally took place when the morning came on that night. The night had been bleak, and they woke up to another morning saying, Jesus is still dead. And the ladies went to the tomb to anoint the body of the Lord Jesus, and they were crying perhaps all the way there. What was it that they were going to discover when the morning light came? Then came the morning. I, I think there's several things that we're going to find that they have experienced, and by uh, by the fact of what we get from that is what we experience as well when the light comes into our life. And we'll find first of all is that they they have encountered new life. They went to the tomb, and the tomb that had been, of course, sealed. The soldiers had been there. They found that the stone had been rolled back and that this was not how they had left it. Their first fear is that Jesus' body has been stolen. Yet the angel said, as he, according to this synoptic gospel here of Matthew, says that the angel sat upon the top of the stone that he had rolled away. And by the way, remember the stone wasn't rolled away so that Jesus could get out, but so that disciples and the women could get in because they needed to be able to see. So the angel rolled that stone away. Now through the years, the skeptics have doubted the resurrection of Jesus. Did it ever take place? Did they steal his body? And, and uh, there's several different types of theories that they have brought into play. And if I began to tell you some of these uh, that sometimes I um, teach about in a Christology class, I could tell you even from the twin theory that Jesus had a twin. I mean, it gets worse than that. 
But by the way, the devil will make up anything he needs to make up to try to disprove what actually has taken place. As a matter of fact, let me say this. On the day of your salvation, right after you've been saved, the devil's going to hit you and say nothing ever took place. This day, if you come to know Christ, you'll walk out these doors and say that that really happened by faith on the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, yes, it did. And you can always take the devil back to the time where you trusted Christ as your personal Savior. Well, he received new life. Some, some said that, well, this follower stole his body, except there's some problems with that. Number one, we think about the fact that Pilate had put the seal of Rome there and said, seal the tomb and put guards there. And they'll have to give their very life if they allow the body of Jesus to be taken from that particular place. So they're not about to steal the body of Jesus. A second point that we could call to mind is the fact of this new life that now has come forth because of the resurrection. He is not here. He's been raised. Is the fact that his disciples who ran in fright on 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 Thursday night and have been running and in hiding in fear ever since they were hiding now on Sunday morning they become as if they have stepped into a phone booth and they come out as Superman because something is something different has just taken place there's a third thing we would say about this and that is that the eyewitnesses the eyewitnesses of the resurrected Lord that we find over and over again, some uh, uh, 10 or 11, depending on how you may count them, post-resurrection appearances that took place of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you would also think this, and one of those appearances was on a hillside above 500 witnesses. You would also think, if you were actually expecting a resurrection to take place, if his disciples actually thought it was going to take place, where do you think they would have been camped out during these days. Well, they'd been right there at the tomb, wouldn't they? Right there expecting this is actually what's going to take place instead of cowering and in fear and not knowing what is going to take place, no purpose, no pursuit in life. And yet we don't find them there. We find them hiding somewhere, and they had to have word brought to them that they initially did not believe. And then we have the New Testament writers themselves. Some of those who began to talk about this from um, Lee Strobel to other uh, Alex McFarlane and Josh McDowell and, and go over and over again, some of those who are apologists in this will tell us that the New Testament writers themselves began to talk about the resurrection in that day and time. You see, all the New Testament was written during a, a particular period of time, probably from 40 A.D., uh, which is within the 10 years of Jesus' death, all the way to about 65 A.D. And so it was written during a time period when if this would have been false information, it would have been challenged right from the start. I'll give you an example of this. When you think of this and you don't hear anything, uh, you, you, know, you began to say, no, no one even challenged it because it was a known fact. Uh, atheistic, just a regular agnostic historians wrote about the resurrection of Jesus as something that actually took place. It would be the same as, think back a few months ago. A few months ago, uh, when uh, our uh, former president, uh, uh, George H.W. Uh, Bush, uh, passed away, and, and you remember the funeral that you saw, you remember going to Washington, you remember coming back, you remember the train that his body was taken on, you remember uh, the burial that took place, and all that time, and the networks were right there as everything took place. Then it would be the same as if when you have watched all of this, that critics began to arise and say, this really wasn't uh, that which took place. Uh, they began to refute that along the way. Have you heard anybody refute his death? Not at all, because they knew exactly that it took place. When you don't hear anything but crickets, then you know it took place. No one disputed this from religious writers to those who were non-religious in that day and time. New life comes about. That's the great thing about knowing Jesus as Savior, and that is new life comes into our being. He gives us life. We thought we had life before, but he says, I've come to give you life and life more abundantly. Our life will not begin when we get to heaven. Our eternal life has begun already.
new life in Christ. There's a second thing that I think we see as a reality of when the morning came, and that is new hope, new hope. He says in verse 6 here that, uh, th- that, that it was said, come see. The angel said, come see the place where he lay, where he has been laying. And, of course, the other gospels began to record things like even the, the napkin that was over his head was neatly folded and laid by in place, and there was no struggle that took place there. The bodily resurrection is the greatest event to ever take place in history. Oliver B. Green always says that the greatest bombshell to ever explode in the face of an unbelieving world is the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ because it can't be doubted. And because of this, we have great hope as well because when we see the resurrected body of the Lord Jesus and we see him beginning to talk to people on that Sunday night, he begins to come into the room where the disciples were. It gives us a picture of what our resurrected body, glorified body, will be like one day when we as well do not have the limitations that we have today. Pastor Stan, are you saying we're going to be able to zip in and out of rooms? I didn't say you would, but I didn't say you wouldn't. There's times now you zip in and out and I don't see you. But I'm telling you there that, that it will be a type, a glimpse of a resurrected body. It gives us great hope that this is not the end. Paul says this, In 1 Corinthians 15, if Christ is not raised, then our preaching is empty and your faith is vain. Let me give you you what that actually means, the translation. Shut the doors, turn off the lights, and don't ever come back again if Jesus be not raised. We're just meeting as a country club and a social event. But thanks be unto God as he would go on to say, but Christ is risen from the dead. So your faith is not in vain. And, and then he says, then if Christ is not risen, then those who have fallen asleep, another terminology used in Scripture for those who have died, then those who have fallen asleep have, have just perished. They're over with. They've died. And uh, nothing else can be said. Their life is over. They've ceased to exist. They've just as if they've been annihilated. And he goes on to say, and if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are the most pitiable of all men. Verse 20, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. There is no resurrection without a bodily resurrection. This wasn't just a mystical type of resurrection. This was a body that he asked them to come and to touch. This is a body that he came in and out of a room. This is a body that sat down by the sea and and had a, a meal there as the fish was baked over the coals. We're talking about a real body. We'll not be in heaven one day like ghosts. We'll be a resurrected body, much like that of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what a day that's going to be. You ought to say that when you walk in front of the mirror at 6 a.m. in the morning. Thank God it's going to get better than this. <laughs> you may have said, I remember when I was in the prime of my life. I barely remember when I was in the prime of my life. But listen, it's not always going to be this way. It's going to get better. Because the truth of the matter is that the resurrection of Jesus gives us the promise and pledge to all of us who believe that though this body die, it's going to be raised and perfected. Not brought back to life just like you look right now. You're going to look the best you've ever looked in your life. A perfect 10. God does nothing in a, in, a, in a sad type of way. He never does anything in a shoddy type of way. It's always in the greatest possible way. So we look at the Word of God, and we see what He has to say about that. That because Christ is raised, we will also be raised one day. There'll be no more having to go to a graveside, and it's not the final resting place, as I point out many times as we go there. Thank God I'll have no more funerals in that day. 
No more times of standing by the graveside as that, as that body is prepared to be lowered into the ground and, and the tears are flowing and there's a temporary separation. Never again will we have to go through those times, but when we stand there, we can say that one of these days at the sound of that last trumpet, when the trumpet shall sound and the dead in Christ shall be raised first, then this which is immortal will take on immortality. This which we've only known in this sense of walking on this earth will take on a new perspective. You see, it takes place then. Now, we're gone at the point of death. At the immediate time of death, there's a separation. That which is alive has gone on to be with the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5 tells us to be absent of this body is to be present with the Lord. And so we are with the Lord in heaven enjoying that. And then we may have gone to a funeral home, may have gone through the processes there, buried in the ground, but on resurrection day, that glorified body, resurrected body, will come forth at the sound of the trumpet, and the dead in Christ will, will be raised first, and then we, who may be alive at that time, as all the believers go up, not every person only believers across this world, buried at sea, wherever they may be, the same God who created in the first place has no problem bringing them back together wherever they may be, whatever state they may happen to be in. But they will be raised first, and then we will be changed. And we will be called up together to, to be changed and to be with those loved ones. And he says, comfort one another with these words. What a day, what a glorious day that's going to be. You see, there's an immediate trans, uh, uh, separation that takes place. You remember, as Jesus in Luke chapter 16 gives the story about the rich man and Lazarus and how at the moment of death that Lazarus died, but the angels carried him into Abraham's bosom, which is another name for heaven as it was in that particular way. It's, it's there with the redeemed, there as we know of the Old Testament. It also says, but the rich man died, and in hell he lifted up his eyes. Now the bodies were still there, still upon this earth, but that soul that's alive has gone one of two directions. And by the way, that still happens every day on planet earth. There's only one of two places that you're going to go. And if you're one of the redeemed in Christ, you're going there. If not, You've got a rude awakening, and there's no buying you back out. There's no praying you back out. You're there for all of eternity. Listen, friend, Jesus died on the cross and was resurrected, so you or no one else would have to go there. But there's immediate separation that takes place. When Stephen died there after he preached in Acts chapter 7, his body died and the Bible says that Jesus was standing, not sitting, but standing at the right hand of God, waiting upon him as he came to heaven. What a reunion that God waits for those on the other side as he calls them home, that he's waiting there for them. So we think about instances such as this, but let's go back to the cross. What about the thief on the cross? You remember what took place there as Jesus was was dying there on the cross, and the repentant thief said to him, will you remember me when you come into your kingdom? And Jesus utters forth those words, today you'll be with me in paradise. Now he wasn't just saying where you're going to be one day. Why did he say today? Because Jesus was preparing to say it is finished and Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And of course, his death took place. But here's the other part of that. You remember in the story there how they came to the thieves on the cross who were still alive. And the soldiers had to break their legs. I've always wondered, what in the world has got, got to do with it? When a, when a person's on the cross, they're literally having to push themselves up with their legs, with their knees, and get a breath. So if your legs are broken... There's no push-up, and a person on the cross always asphyxiates. They cannot get a breath in, cannot get a breath out. 
And because Sabbath was coming there at sunset, they had to make sure these criminals were not going to be there on the cross and them be a defilement. So they hastened the death of these soldiers. And so when that thief died, he was right then today, as Jesus said, with him in paradise. So if you had a mystery there, you know exactly what he was talking about when he came to that today. So in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we have the new hope that we are going to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. Psalm 30 verse 5 says that darkness may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. For these disciples, there was sadness, there was darkness, there was gloom, there was despair. And many of us have been through that in times of losing a loved one, losing a family member, somebody we hold very close. But listen, thank God, death is not the end for the believer. As a matter of fact, their body has died, but they're alive forever. When they received eternal life, they've gone on to the other side, and they're in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And by the way, for those who have not, they continue to live eternally, but in eternal torments, according to, again, the scriptures that we read about that and what Jesus had to say. So because joy came in the morning, and when the morning light broke, there's new life, there's new hope, but also there was a new testimony. Verse 5 says, go quickly and tell his disciples that he's risen from the dead. And indeed, that he's going to go before them into Galilee, and of course, he would begin to appear to them. So the explicit directions and instruction to the women were this, go tell his disciples. Go and tell. It doesn't get any simpler than that. And by the way, our testimony still has to be told. No such thing as secret saints. God expects us to tell the great news of what's taking place with other people out there. Now you think about this. There, those that had been resurrection skeptics up to this particular time, the women came back, and if you read the synoptic stories, the disciples did not initially believe. As a matter of fact, Peter and John ran to the tomb because they wanted to see themselves, and the other ones sat there, probably led by Thomas. But they all sat there. And at least Thomas, when Jesus appears on Sunday night, is not even present. And then Jesus makes a return visit on the following Sunday night, Thomas present, to which Jesus, knowing his thoughts, said, Thomas, you want to touch them? Here's my scars. Here's my side. And he said, no, Lord. My Lord and my God, I believe. I see you. And then he made the statement that includes all of us. He said this, you see because you've, you, you believe because you've seen, but blessed are those, you and me, who believe who have never seen. Anybody here ever seen God? Anybody here ever seen Jesus? No. We believe by faith. And so he says, blessed are you. You didn't know you were in the Bible. But you're there. You're also at the end of, of, uh, of chapter 11 of Hebrews when it says, in others. Seriously, you can read that. Don't read it now. But we have a new testimony. So as Jesus appeared to them, he gives them uh, their, their word. I'm here just like I told you. And listen, I'm just thinking, because I kind of like to be visual here. I'm, I'm thinking, guys, didn't I just tell you I'm coming back? How many times, if you go back and look, did Jesus say, I'm going to die? I'm going to be led up by the chief priests and scribes. I am going to die, but I'm coming back again. He even told the religious leaders, kill this body, tear down this temple, and in three days, it's coming back, going to rise up again. He told it over and over again, but they just never got it. It's kind of like being in algebra class. Sometimes you just don't get it. And they didn't. And it never rained true to them. Someone said, uh, I think it was D. James Kennedy, said of the 333 prophecies of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and the Bible, there were also uh, not only those fulfilled, but 456 historical known facts that have taken place. And then, as I think I said last week, someone has figured out that the chances of all of these prophecies being fulfilled by one singular man is one chance in 84 followed by a hundred zeros. You know what that word is. I don't. 
I don't get beyond billions and trillions and that kind of thing, whatever that may happen to be. But the testimony doesn't stop there. As a matter of fact, everything began to change. The church started meeting on Sundays. You say, well, what's the big deal about that? For the church who has always been at that time no, those messianic, non-messianic, but yet looking to a Messiah, now messianic believers, is a big deal because they had always worshipped on the Saturday. They had always gone on what was the traditional Sabbath. So for them to start meeting on Sunday was a big deal. They received a new testimony, and because of that, we serve and we worship and we celebrate every Sunday. But I want to tie in yet another thing, and that is a new purpose. They had a new purpose about them. Verse 8, it says, So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy. That was that mixture. It's kind of like getting up to preach or getting up to sing. you got fear and joy at the same time, right, Chris? There's a little bit of that. You say, you get nervous? Every time I have to stand up here and look at you, I'm nervous. It's Sunday morning, if it's a Sunday night, if it's a Wednesday night, wherever it may happen to be, uh, because of the awesome responsibility that it is, but also because, I mean, we're talking about heaven and hell. We're talking about eternal things here. We're talking about those who will receive the word. Some will reject the word. Some will walk out and their life will not be changed. And so there's a mixture of fear and joy at the same time and, and the adrenaline that begins to flow here. But these disciples had new purpose. Perhaps the hardest steps they would ever take was on that night away from the Garden of Gethsemane as they ran from their Lord. But I want to tell you, when John tells us that Peter and John ran to the tomb, John never mentions himself. He always says that other disciple. And as Peter and John went, uh, ran to the tomb, John says it this way, and that other disciple beat Peter to the tomb. That's the way he says it. He says it in humility, but he also took credit for beating Peter there to the tomb. And look, it says when they went in, they believed. Word of belief there. And of course came back and told the others there's no essence that they actually all believed until at least that Sunday night without Thomas being present. So we find here a new purpose. They went out quickly. Now, you would think, again, they would have been there by the tomb if they were actually expecting a resurrection to take place. You would think that they would have been there and saying, all right, he's going to be back in a couple of days. Listen, there's people who camp out longer than that for basketball tickets. <laughs> if they would have been expecting him, they would have been there. But they actually thought, this is it, this is over. They didn't believe, undoubtedly, they didn't have a real belief or didn't understand what he had said about that. And so they're nowhere to be found. But let me say this. The resurrection is what gives us real purpose in life. We've got real purpose in life because we are the only group of believers in the world who worship today because of a risen Savior. They can go to Muhammad's grave. They can go to Buddha's grave. They can go to all their other believers, the ones that follow after them. They can go to their grave. But we've got a risen Savior today, and he's in heaven. And guess what? He's coming back. So we've got a new purpose, and that new purpose is to tell other people because of our new testimony of what Jesus has done in our life, what he wants to do in theirs, and that he is our only hope eternally, and everything that he ever said that he was going to do, he actually did, so that everything in the Word of God that talks about has been fulfilled, is being fulfilled, and therefore will be fulfilled, is going to take place. And when we look at the everyday news that is given to us on the world scene, we literally see prophecies being fulfilled that point us to the time when Jesus will come again. As a matter of fact, you say, well, how far out do you think it is? I think it's so far I may not get a back, I may not even get to walk to the back of the foyer today. You say, really? I'm, I'm really not looking for that undertaker. I'm looking for the upper taker. And it could be today. We don't know for sure. You say, well, you know, but the chances are, listen, how do you know? He says, I'm, and if they were looking then, you say, well, see there, they were looking then, he didn't come, so we just can't believe it. In the hour that you think not, the Son of Man is coming. That's what he said. 
and he's coming. We've got a new purpose. We've got a new testimony. But finally, let me say, we've got a new courage that took place. Notice what takes place in their life here because it says they brought his disciples news there at the last part of verse number 8. So they went quickly, and they ran, and they brought the disciples' words. Now, the other, other reports tell us that not everybody necessarily believed that report, these are just women that are bringing this word. And remember, a woman's word in that day and time was not necessarily held in the highest esteem. And so when they brought the word back, they thought, ah, they're just seeing things. And even when Peter and John came back, perhaps some of them still not saying that, and especially Thomas. Now, I've got to see it for myself before I'm going to believe this. The truth of the matter is, though, because of this, they have new courage. How could you explain that for these disciples who ran in fear and were in hiding, nowhere around the cross to be seen, now, because of this Sunday morning, we're out there preaching the Word of God. It's one of the greatest proofs that Jesus indeed was alive, that Jesus indeed appeared to them because they were totally different creatures because of this. They were willing to take on hell itself for the cause of Christ because Jesus did everything that they, he really said he was going to do. Why were we so slow to believe, as Jesus told those disciples on the way there to Emmaus, uh, that, that, that we just don't believe the words that he said? They got so courageous that they stood even before the chief priest and scribes and others on that day and when they had been beaten when they had been threatened do not preach this again in Acts chapter 5 they said this to them we must obey God rather than man you see the resurrection is the emphasis of the entire New Testament and the preaching truths from Peter uh, on the day of Pentecost, as he talked about uh, the resurrected Christ and what he did, it was the theme of that message to the theme of the Apostle Paul, who used to kill Christians, arrest Christians, now was leading people to Christ and preaching about Christ since his Damascus Road experience. You talk about a turnaround and had authored half of the New Testament as we have it today. I would say it's a miraculous turnabout around, and it's a new courage that takes place. The resurrection is the entire emphasis here. But not just a merely a doctrine for the future. For them, it was worth dying for. Now, most of us here today will probably say, I'll never have to die for my faith, and we don't know that to be so. But if you were called into account and someone held you Columbine style, a gun to your head and said, recant your faith, would you say, nope, I'm a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ and proud of it? Would you walk that way every day, unashamedly and unafraid to profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? Well, let me say that about this new courage, that every one of these disciples that we know of suffered a martyr's death. Everything from being crucified to being crucified upside down to being pierced through to being skinned alive to being clubbed to death. Historically, traditionally awful stories. Would you do that for something you really didn't believe? I don't think so. These cowards were now courageous because they were different when the morning light came. How about you today? Do you know this Christ? Listen, this is Easter. We're supposed to be here. But is it so real to you that you can't help but be quiet? As you go through the day, will the rest of your activities just be like it's another day? I think about those people in, in Paris. They've lost a a tremendous building that's been there for so long. Nine centuries, well, more than that, actually. We think about all this time that it has been there and everything that they've gone through. But for it just to be a loss and them not really be believers and for them not really to, to believe in the resurrected Christ and what it's all about, or to believe it, listen, as a head knowledge as many Americans do today. It's an event in history that took place, and they've got it right here, but they don't have it right here. What's the difference between heaven and hell? About 18 inches. 
It's more than just an event in time. It's more than just a historical event. It's more than just a tradition. It's more than just a culture. It's a personal relationship. So let me ask you, is it personal in your life? Can you go back to the time where you repented of your sins, you trusted Jesus as your personal Savior, because when everything's said and done, that's the only thing that's going to matter. Matter of fact, it's not just when you die, because as I said, Jesus could come today. If you're not ready and that's not taking place, you're left behind to face the tribulation upon this earth. And if you think it gets bad at times now, when you read what it's going to be like in Daniel and the Revelation, you don't want to be left behind. So do you know the Lord Jesus Christ personally? Has that come into your life? Have you repented of your sins and asked Christ to come into your life? And if not, why not today? On this Easter Sunday. On this day. Maybe you've been following Jesus afar off. Kind of doing your own thing as if life's all about you. And as long as you can kind of dash into church every now and then and do this and that, then you think God's going to hold that up to you in and, and, and such a way to say, okay, you're okay. You still every once in a while did this and that. No, let me ask you today, what's stopping you from being a sold-out follower of the Lord Jesus Christ? What's stopping you from being like one of these early apostles who when they recognized the truth of the resurrection, their life would never be the same and willing to go through hell itself and death for the sake of the gospel. Are you willing to follow him in that particular way? Whatever your needs are, whatever your problems are today, let me say this, we have a resurrected Lord who can help you. Would you bow your heads right where you are across this place today? And let me say this, for many of you, the morning light has hit. And it's the time and the moment of decision. When you repent of your sins, trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you can do that today. Well, I don't know that I've done that. I'm not, I'm not sure that I, I really meant business when that took place so long ago. Whatever the situation may be for you, let me say this. Hell's a long time, or eternity's a long time to be wrong. And there's no turning back. So today, if you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, I'm going to ask you to pray along right now. Ask Christ to come into your life just as many of us have done. And this can be that time of your spiritual birthday. Let's pray together. Father, in Jesus' name, I come on behalf of every person here today. Lord, I can't see their heart and I don't know their relationship between themselves and you. And they may certainly be a, a follower of yours. And it's not a strained relationship, Lord. It's just a true following. But for some, if they can't really go to that time and there's been a change in their life, a time where they repented of their sins and trusted Christ, would you allow them right now to do that? Lord, as I lead them through this prayer, I pray their heart will simply be bent toward you. As right now, they pray like this, Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. And I do believe that Jesus died on that cross for my sins. Please forgive me. Of that sin, I trust Jesus as my Savior who died for me. Come into my life and be my Savior, my Lord, from this day forth. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. And Lord, I thank you for those who are willing to pray that prayer. I pray for others today who, who may be in the midst of talking about this. Their heart has twinged a little because they realize they're following you at a guilty distance they're not giving their all to the master they're not serving you like they should like we should serve a risen, risen savior today their heart's going to come back to you as, as they just do business right now between themselves and you thank you Lord that you receive us back thank you Lord that you'll restore us if we'll just call out to you for if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, you know every need in this place today. Those who are burdened down, burdens are listed at Cal lifted at Calvary. Those who began to list their problems before you this day, thank you. There's no problem that's too big for you. So, Lord, as we move in this invitation, help us to seal that right now. Step forward to tell us, one of us here today, what we have done, the decision that's been made. Help us this day to respond to you. In Jesus' name, amen. As we stand together, would you respond? Maybe just to come.
pray with one of us. Take a knee here and bow. Whatever the need of your life is, if we can help you in any way, would you come right now? You know, it looked like any other morning when the ladies went to the tomb. But as the dawn began to break, the sun began to come up, they found that the tomb was empty. And because morning came, because the tomb was empty, it brought about all kinds of new possibilities. New life, number one, not only for Jesus, but for each of us. A new hope, a new purpose in life, and a new testimony upon our heart. God gives us everything because of the resurrection. Let me ask you a question. Jesus came to life, but has there ever come a time in your life where you have come to life through the power of the resurrected Christ, the power of the empty tomb? Well, today can be your day. On this Sunday, you can ask the Lord Jesus Christ to come into your empty heart, and all of a sudden it can become full. And so right now, I'm going to ask you to join us in a time of prayer. And because of the results of the resurrection, you can have that power of the resurrection as well. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for each and every person who is watching the broadcast today. And Lord, I thank you for their lives and for those who may be watching who know about the Christ, but they don't know him personally. Father, I pray that this is the day for their salvation. Would you give them the faith right now just to pray to you a prayer of faith much like this. Dear God, I realize that I am a sinner, and I do believe that Jesus died on the cross for my sins. Please forgive me of my sin and come into my life and be my Savior, my Lord, from this day forth. Please give me the strength now to live for you. And Father, I thank you for those whose empty hearts now have become full of you. And you said that if we would invite you in, you would come in, that you'd never leave us nor forsake us. I pray for believers today who need to be encouraged by the results of the empty tomb, that we can have life, but only not only life here, but life eternally, that when this life ceases, we still have life with you. So, Father, we pray that today you would encourage that heart. For those who may be watching that are walking a guilty distance away, even as some of the disciples were, Lord, I pray that this is the day they'll come back to you. And this will be the turning point, the defining moment in their life when they decide to follow you with all of their heart and life. Father, would you bless them indeed as you hear their prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for watching the broadcast today. My prayer for you is that you'll live in the power of the resurrected Christ. That's what Paul said, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. That's the power we can have each and every day because of the empty tomb. May the Lord bless you. May he give you a good day and a godly week. We'll see you next time. If you would like to help support ministry at West Asheville Baptist Church, you can do so by visiting our website, westashvillebaptist.org, to give online or by calling the church office at 828-253-9824.